three, and we're one of the co of this wonderful conference. Thank you all for coming. Um, I wanted to uh, just introduce briefly to you uh, Richard Hobbs, who um, it's appropriate that we sang in a bilingual manner to welcome him. Uh, he is a man who has uh, committed his life from very early on to being a, a bilingual, multicultural, border-crossing ally and advocate and served uh, in our congregation in San Jose, uh, served an elected official uh, with the um, Community College Board, but I'm trying to remember the name of it. San Jose Evergreen Commu Community College Board. He also served um, as the director of the Human Relations uh, Department for the County of Santa Clara. Um, and now he is back to practicing law as an immigration attorney and serving as a policy director for Santa Clara County's um, Association of Immigration Lawyers Association. I got the letters mixed up. Anyway, what I can tell you is he's a very smart guy with a huge heart and we had a wonderful time traveling around in El Salvador together, so I had the opportunity to know him in many dimensions. Please welcome Richard Hobbs to our <laughs> conference. Thank you very much. Uh, I first met Lindy at the Unitarian Church of San Jose back in 1990. We established a committee called the Comité Ella Correa para Refugiados Centroamericanos. The Ella Correa, who is the priest who was assassinated in El Salvador, uh, Central American Refugee Committee. And in fact, the sexton who is still at the Unitarian Church was a person that I actually called uh, on the border because he was being detained in Harlingen, Texas in 1989. And, and he continues to be the sexton of our church uh, in San Jose. Uh, more recently, the church has joined people acting in community together. And we are one of five congregations who are working on immigration issues, especially around the criminal justice area in Santa Clara County and particularly in San Jose. Uh, as Lindy mentioned, I've been uh, very active. I think it's important that all of us activate ourselves. For the last two years before I opened my immigration office in April, I was with SIREN, Services Immigrant Rights and Education Network, and we fought very hard, like I'm sure all of you did, for immigration reform until the Republicans took over in November and really comprehensive immigration reform became a dead item for two years at least. And so we really uh, don't have uh, much opportunity. But during those two years, I know a lot of you were active too. I was tear gassed by Orpaio myself in Phoenix. And I sat in at the National Republican that they have suffered or that they are likely to, there's a clear suffering persecution. And so this well-founded fear of persecution needs to be based on one of five, race, ethnicity, religion, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Some social groups that have been successful have been um, gay men and women, and also there's a recent case from the Ninth Circuit where Guatemalan women were allowed to be classed as a, as a group that suffered persecution in Guatemala. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's a large group, Guatemalan women. There are 62,000 refugees in the world, of which 30, I'm sorry, million, 62 million and about 34 million are displaced by war. And the largest refugee countries are Afghanistan, Iraq, Myanmar, Sudan, and the Palestinian territories. Under the headquarters in Washington, D.C., uh, we had 500,000 people in Washington, D.C. advocating for welfare, for immigration reform, uh, the day that uh, the, uh, the Health Care Act was signed. And so it was basically ignored by the media. But we, there were huge mobilizations. We had a thousand people ringing Santa Clara University when Janet Napolitano, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, who was a graduate of the University of Santa Clara, came to Santa Clara to give a graduation speech. So it's very important that we activate and mobilize. And that will be my message also at the end. Of, of this presentation. Today what we're really going to be focusing on is the nuts and bolts of immigration. I, I am going to assume that you have a kind of an average level of understanding of immigration law and the structure and institutions of immigration in our country. 
So uh, let me uh, just start by talking a little bit of demographics. The structure of this is I'll try to get through a fair amount of information pretty quickly. Tell me if I'm going too fast. And, and then we will have time for, for question and answer. And if, uh, if it's uh, 12 o'clock and I haven't stopped talking, which I'm sure I will though, uh, please stop me so that we have at least 15 minutes of, of Q&A because I think that's probably the most important. I also hope that you have that, that, that has all of this information on it. It's a PowerPoint presentation with 25 slides. In terms of demographics, we have about 41 million immigrants in the United States. And of immigrant is foreign born. That's the working definition. They were born in another country. The biggest countries to the United States, which happen to be also the, the biggest countries to Silicon Valley, where I live, are Mexico, China, Vietnam, the Philippines, and India. Those are the top five sending countries to the United States. We have about 11 million undocumented. About 54% are from Mexico, 26% from Central America, and about 11% from Asia. Of course, the Asians, there's an ocean, so most of them obviously are overstays. They didn't come across the border. I was in India earlier this year, and I asked people, if India occupied the geographic position of Mexico, how many Indians would try to enter the United States? And the least uh, estimate I got was 300 million from India would try to enter the United States, that was the very least. So I think that border explains a lot. We have the biggest discrepancy earth with that border, and that explains a lot in terms of the opportunity that we were just hearing about. Uh, there are about a million people per year, and two-thirds of them enter through family-based immigration. There are a number of immigration legal categories. One is an immigrant being a non-immigrant, and we're going to talk about this in a second. Secondly, lawful permanent residents, those who have a green card. Third, refugees and asylees. Fourth, undocumented immigrants who either crossed the border illegally or overstayed their visa. Fifth, naturalized citizens. And then there are other minor categories. For example, those who were fleeing civil war in El Salvador, many of them got temporary protected status. And there are a number of countries, including Somalians, that have temporary protected status. Another example is VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act. If a, uh, an immigrant is married to a lawful permanent resident or a citizen and suffers domestic violence, that person can self-petition to get a green card. So that's another category that's really not up here. Non-immigrants are immigrants who come to the United States and there are about 25 million per year who enter just on visitor's visas, and they don't intend to permanently reside in the United States. They get an I-94, which is a little white arrival departure card, when they enter and they're given a certain period of time to stay in the United States. Now, it's interesting that there are 36 countries where you don't need a visa to come into the United States. You just go to the airport and you say, I want to go to New York, or I want to go to San Francisco, and they let those people from 36 countries come into the United States. Why? Because they probably have a better standard of living and better human rights record than we do in this country, and there's no fear that they're not going to go back to their home country, because these are not the poor countries on Earth. These are the European nations, Japan, etc. The This is a little bit of the AB soup of non-immigrant visas. I'm sure you're familiar with some of them. The B visas are for business or for pleasure. There are treaty investors who can get in by paying a certain amount of money. Students, H-1B professionals, which is what in Silicon Valley people come in on as uh, software engineers, for example. H-2A agricultural workers, H-2B temporary service workers, very difficult to get exchange visitors, fiancé petition, uh, vocational student, religious worker, and the U visa is really interesting. I'm going to take a quick second to talk about the U visa. If you know of an undocumented person who has been the victim of a crime in the United States and there has been a police report filed, they can get a four-year you non-immigrant status visa and after three years apply for a green card. 
So uh, I'm doing a lot of these U visas. It's amazing how many undocumented immigrants have been victims of crimes. This includes assault, robbery, domestic violence, and this is, there are 10,000 visas per year that are given, and it's a really good way for people, even who have been previously deported, to get a green card, ultimately. I'm going to talk about four different categories of getting a green card, lawful permanent residence. First of all, there is what we call immediate relatives. Immediate relatives are the parents, spouses, and minor children of U.S. citizens. So if you are a U.S. citizen, you can petition, and that person can enter the United States immediately if they are a minor child, a spouse, or a parent. There is no numerical limit, but about 250,000 people get green cards that way each year. Once again, there's no backlog. People can enter immediately. There are two processes. One is if you enter the country legally with inspection, then you can adjust status in the United States. You don't have to leave the United States to, for your green card. And secondly, there are many people who enter the United States without inspection and marry a U.S. citizen, and they must leave the country in order to get their green card. And if they've been in this country in unlawful presence for one year or more, they need to apply for an unlawful presence waiver. And frankly, most attorneys in the Bay Area charge at least $6,000 for this process of counselor processing with the waiver. The waiver is very complicated. The last waiver I did, I sent over 100 pages to Ciudad Juarez. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's tough. You have to document it well. And this is very common for undocumented immigrants. As you can see, there's no same-sex petitioning allowed. Uh, there was a bill, the Uniting American Families Act, that was introduced in 2009, but we still don't allow that. I, I saw a question. Okay, secondly, there is the family-based system with numerical limitations. There are a minimum of 226,000 visas per year that are given out um, with a cap of $480,000 I'm sorry, people, <laughs> uh, including immediate relatives. And there's also an annual cap of 25,650 visas per country. What this cap per country means is that Mexico or India or China has the same number of visas as Andorra or Luxembourg. And that has created a backlog. And so there are four countries that are special and, and backlogged very far, actually, in many categories. And those countries are Mexico, India, the Philippines, and China. Uh, there are percentage limitations also within each preference category. And these are the preference categories. The first preference is the unmarried sons and daughters of US citizens, which is about 23,000 people. The second preference is for the spouses and children of permanent residents. That takes about three years. So if you have a green card, you cannot legally be with your three-year-old child for three years. You cannot legally be with your husband for three years. You have to petition and wait for them to be able to enter this country. And then the second category of those who have a green card and are petitioning for family members is for those who are the unmarried sons and daughters that are 21 years or older. So sometimes, for example, if you're, say, 35 years old and you're from the Philippines and your mother doesn't have citizenship, she only has a green card, well, if that 35-year-old is married, sometimes they'll get a divorce so that they can be eligible for this visa. People do strange things to get a visa. The third category is married sons and daughters of U.S. citizens, also 23,000. And the fourth category that is the most backlogged category is the brothers and sisters of adult U.S. citizens, 65,000 per year. And this is the most backlogged category. If you're from the Philippines, the wait is 23 years. The third area or way to get a green card is through employment-based immigration. There are 140,000 visas available annually to enter the United States. 
These are the categories. I'm going to go through them very quickly. The first is priority workers for those with extraordinary ability or outstanding uh, professors or researchers or multinational executives and managers. The second is professionals holding advanced degrees or persons of exceptional ability. The third is skilled workers, professionals, and others, including unskilled workers. So the third preference is the only way that somebody really with, without a college degree can get into the United States through work. So a lot of times people say, well, why don't they just apply for a work permit? Well, uh, you ha there are only 10,000 visas maximum allowed for unskilled labor in the United States. And to get a labor certification through this process, it typically will cost the person six to $10,000 with a private immigration attorney. And they will have to wait seven years. This category is backlogged seven years before they can come in. And through the labor certification process, the employer must swear and certify that no lawful permanent resident or US citizen employee is willing to take that job. So nobody does this. It's not a practical, which employer is gonna wait seven years to hire a worker when they need them now? The, the fourth preference is for special immigrants like ministers, religious workers like Lindy Ramsden, international organization employees, etc. And the final one is uh, employment creation. These are people who invest $1 million and will create 10 jobs with their investment, and they become conditional residents for two years, and if after, ten year, after two years they have actually created 10 jobs, then they can get a green card, a permanent residence, as opposed to conditional residence. The last category I'm gonna talk about is diversity visas. We're actually right now in the period from October 4th to November 4th, where uh, people from around the world and people in the United States can apply for the lottery. And the lottery is 55,000 visas per year. This year there are only 50,000 because Congress has decided to allot 5,000 to uh, special immigrants under NACARA, which is a, basically a Central American and Cuban um, refu refugee act. Um, this exclude, the diversity visas really don't work for most of the people we know. The oversubscribed countries, countries that have a lot of immigration to the United States are excluded. If you're Mexican, you cannot apply for a diversity visa. If you're Salvadoran, Indian, Chinese, you cannot apply. Now, what is a, a refugee? There is what is known as international refugee law. And under international refugee law, refugees who are outside of, for example, the United States and asylees who are inside refugees will come into the country and from, from what countries. And this is a very political determination. If you remember during the 1980s, uh, the president at that time, Reagan, determined that not one Salvadoran and not one Guatemalan was a refugee. So the only way that they could get a green card because of their sincere fear of persecution was to get into the United States and apply for asylum. And when they did come into the United States and apply for asylum, because, quote unquote, these were democracies in El Salvador and Guatemala, the uh, immigration service denied 99% of asylum applications to Guatemalans and 98% to Salvadorans. So there was no sympathy at all until the federal government was sued under um, Mark, Mark Vanderhout in San Francisco actually sued the federal government. In uh, 2009, to give an example, there were 75,000 refugees allowed into the United States. Of the over 5 million displaced Iraqis, the United States has accepted about 20,000 refugees. As I mentioned, asylum has the same legal standard, but it's a determination made inside the United States. Now, why do most immigrants come to the United States? Um, mostly for family reunification and to escape poverty. The largest single, of course, is to escape poverty and also due to persecution as refugees or asylees. I'm gonna speak 
pretty quickly here about causes of immigration. I know that we could have group discussions for the next two hours about globalization and the causes of immigration. But I want to point out just a few uh, things that I think are, are critical in terms of understanding why immigrants, why refugees. We have on Earth over two billion people living on less than two dollars a day, over one billion people that are going to bed hungry at night, and why? Why when there were very sustainable economies in many countries around the world until the last maybe 150 years? First, there's direct foreign investment, and mostly that's done to exploit human beings and to exploit resources, and that also takes away resources from local economies. And so people lose control of their local economies. If you've read the book, When Corporations Rule the World by David Corton, who worked in foreign aid for 35 years and has a PhD from Harvard in economics, what he said is that foreign aid actually winds up being a deterrent to local economies because ultimately local people have to have local control of their local economies and their political system in order for people to stay in their home countries. So we also have uh, state incentives. This is very common throughout Latin America and the third world. Free trade zones like the one Bartolomo in, in El Salvador. Uh, tax fund that they give to corporations, much like we see in the United States, really, the favoritism, the, all the breaks that we give to corporations. Tied loans, where, for example, the United States will allow a, uh, a, a company or a country to receive $2 billion as long as 90% of it is used to purchase military equipment in the United States from large corporations. Foreign aid that I've mentioned, unequal terms of trade, monopoly pricing, only monopolies can really set prices that, can, that people around the world have to pay, speculation, corruption. I actually wrote my master's thesis in Mexico. I lived in Mexico City for five years and my master's thesis was on corruption in Mexico. So I wrote 600 pages and that's only the first volume. Uh, structural adjustment policies from the IMF and the World Bank and these free trade agreements that I'm going to talk a little bit more about now in the context of Mexico. So if we look at, at Mexico, really, NAFTA, as was mentioned, was approved on January 1st, 1994. I remember trying to convince Norman Mineta at the time, who was a congressman, not to vote for NAFTA, and he went ahead and voted anyway, as many Democrats did. And we do know the, the impacts of NAFTA, and I'll talk about them in a second. So we have three very explosive elements in terms of understanding why immigration from Mexico. First of all, we have the most advanced technology on earth in terms of agriculture. Secondly, we have the most subsidized agriculture on earth. Through the Farm Bill, we give about $44 billion away to the, uh, the largest agribusinesses in the United States. It's averaged about 6 to $10 billion a year for the last 10 years, given to the largest corn growers in the United States. So we have the most subsidized corn, by far, of, of any country on Earth. And then third, when you added this element of free trade, when suddenly the Mexican government, by its own decision, decided that it could no longer protect its own people growing its own crops, because that's what NAFTA means, free trade, we can no longer erect protective barriers to protect our corn growers. With these three elements, this is what we got. First of all, we got Mexican corn growers who cannot compete with the cheap corn that is dumped in Mexico. Five years ago, I was in Oaxaca in a small town so called San Miguel Huautla. The only corn that you could buy in San Miguel Huautla, a little pueblo of 3,000 people, was genetically modified U.S. corn in the only store in Conasupo in this tiny town in Oaxaca. Why? Because the Oaxacans, could, even though corn is from that area, I mean, Mesoamerica is the, or the origin of corn, they now can no longer compete with this incredibly subsidized uh, corn that's, uh, that's being dumped throughout Mexico. 
So from that, two to five million people have lost their livelihoods. Some people say as much as 10 million people. Secondly, Mexican artisans and small business people who before used to make things like shoes and uh, common household items have been pretty much replaced by China. And so these small business people, independent craftspeople, uh, no longer can compete with, with China at this point. And about 8 million people have lost their jobs just from that competition. Third, you have the Maquila factories that are on the border and also in, in Monterrey, Guadalajara, and Mexico City. And once again, these factories can no longer compete with the United States. Um, in China, uh, this is data from I think two years ago, the average cost of doing business in China per hour was 71 cents an hour and in Mexico was $2.82 an hour. And so it's four times cheaper to move your factory from Mexico to China. And that's exactly what has happened. I was at um, a conference in, in, in Monterey, Mexico, called the United Nations uh, Conference on Financing for Development. And the headlines when I got there were uh, 40,000 jobs lost in Monterey in the last three months. And that's because factories in Monterey, Mexico had closed and they had moved to China. So what do you get when you add those three elements to the fact that there are one million young Mexicans entering the job market every year without a whole lot of prospects and no real significant development plan or strategy by the Mexican government and no ability to protect its own uh, economic interests, you get immigration. You also get migration because many Mexicans who are thrown off their farms uh, go to uh, the borders, the border uh, cities and to uh, Guadalajara and Monterey and Mexico City where you know there are quote unquote opportunities but there aren't very many anymore. Uh, so based upon this the World Council of Churches has called immigrants quote unquote refugees from the world economy meaning that primarily uh, immigrants are seeking a place to live and work because of this global economic dislocation. In one focus group that I led in Santa Clara County about 11 years ago, we had refugees from many different countries that were war-torn and also immigrants from Mexico and, and other places. And I asked several questions, the last, including why did you leave your country? And ultimately, they all agreed that it was primarily for economic reasons, that even civil wars, for example, in the former Yugoslavia and in El Salvador and in other places uh, typically were manipulated for economic interests. So that was the conclusion of that focus group. What is the impact on people without papers? Well, first of all, uh, undocumented immigrants uh, really don't have the right to live in a nuclear family. They don't have the right to, to be with their brothers and sisters and, and wives and children, as I mentioned. Many times there is a, uh, a, a weight under the preference system. And in addition, 11 million people have no way to be reunited if they cross that border and left family behind. There, as was mentioned, uh, there is no line to stand in. There is no line to stand in. Secondly, uh, they cannot receive federal or state loans for higher education. Uh, in most states, uh, they, they cannot receive many scholarships. They can't receive uh, state tuition in 40 states. This is one of the problems with the Federal DREAM Act, is the way the Federal DREAM Act is, is structured right now, is it allows people, students who uh, have go gone to a school of higher education for two years or join the military for two years to ultimately get a green card. Forty states do not allow in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants. Forty states. So in those 40 states, the only option under the existing Federal DREAM Act proposal is if they join the military for two years. Because they can't afford foreign student tuition, which is ten times higher, typically, than in-state tuition. So this is a flaw and it's, it's, it's a tough call because a lot of people support the DREAM Act even as is and other people say no. 
we shouldn't be promoting militarism by saying this is the only option that you have to get a green card, join the military. Obviously also uh, undocumented immigrants cannot vote, they cannot access a safety net, they cannot drive, they cannot get a social security card, they cannot get insurance on their car, and they really can't do very basic things that a lot of us take for granted. For example, I know a person who tried to just join 24-hour fitness and they, they demanded a, a driver's license. And they didn't have a driver's license and so they couldn't join 24-hour fitness. Another person who had a, a, uh, a lease on a, uh, was renting an apartment and the landlord uh, suddenly said, well, I need to see that you, know, you are the owner of the car that you park. This was in Sunnyvale. I need to know that you're the owner of the, of, of the car that you park here at the apartment complex every day. Well, they couldn't show that they were the owner because they couldn't get a driver's license to be the owner, and so they had to move. These are common things, common indignities that happen every day to undocumented people, to 11 million people in our country. If I look at this list, this is the list of basic human rights that is um, enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and yet these basic human rights, the right to be with your family, the right to work, the right to drive, etc., are being denied uh, millions of people. Immigrant families right now are in crisis. The family-based preference system is broken. There's over six million people waiting in the preference system right now. There's no way to legalize status under the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, that was the last amnesty or legalization program, uh, people who entered the country before January 1st, 1982, were eligible to get, to legalize, to get amnesty. So you had to be here before, you had to be here as of December 1981, December 1981. We're almost, in two months, we'll be at December 2011. So for 30 years, people who have been here undocumented have not had a line to stand in for 30 years. The um, impact of undocumented status is the denial of basic human rights. Uh, families are impacted differently. Uh, when we did a study in Silicon Valley, uh, of, for example, wage levels between different immigrant groups that also reflects immigrant status, but also the, the ways that immigrants come in from different countries. Uh, people from India were receiving $32 an hour, from China, $23 an hour, from the Philippines, $17 an hour, from uh, Vietnam, $14 an hour, and from Mexico, $10 an hour. So that's a little bit of the pecking system the pecking order of the top five immigrant countries in Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and those, if you think about it, Indians who come in, first of all, have to cross an ocean. Secondly, they almost all come in as H-1Bs, so, so they come in with a degree in hand and a job in hand, so they're going to make more money than somebody from Mexico. And there are unprecedented levels of deportation and family separation. <coughs> uh, last week, the Obama administration announced that 396,000 people had been deported in the last fiscal year. That ended last September 30th. And by the way, this uh, means that 621,000 kids were left without parents. So to translate into human terms, 621,000 kids, most of them U.S. citizens, were left without a parent because of this record number of deportations. I actually computed this last night because you always prepare something the night before, right? And uh, under the Bush administration, during those eight years of the Bush administration, 16,000 immigrants were being deported every month. Under Obama, 33,000 have been deported every month since Obama came to office, twice as many as under Bush. Uh, the reasons for these record deportations, uh, secure communities, these ICE audits, the I-9 audits, the E-Verify, e that certain employers are, you verify that somebody has a green card, it's a, 
a, uh, an electric system that's relatively foolproof. Uh, 287G, which is uh, a program where local jurisdictions can deputize their law enforcement to do the work. Um, increased border enforcement, we heard about Operation Gatekeeper. And then state laws like the ones in Alabama, Georgia, and Arizona. Um, criminals and absconders, absconders are persons who, who basically uh, have been deported but have not left the country. Because legally you go to a deportation hearing and you're, you're found to be deportable, but it doesn't mean that you're taken into custody at that point. And so in the United States, we have 400,000 people who have not left the country, but that number is decreasing rapidly under the Obama administration. Uh, but criminals and absconders are not the majority of deportees. The majority are people who are just trying to live and work and survive in the United States. Um, these are a few rights. Um, if you are an immigrant, you have the right to not answer any questions to remain silent, to not give your name, to not say how you entered the United States or where you're from. It, in, in immigration court proceedings, and I do a lot of deportation defense in court, it's the ICE attorney who has the duty to demonstrate that the person before them is from another country and that they entered the country illegally. So anytime that a person gives that information to ICE when, for example, they have their first contact with ICE, they're doing their work for them, and they shouldn't do that. They should just remain silent and say that, um, you know, I don't want to talk to you until I have an attorney present. They shouldn't sign any papers, and they should understand that anything that they say or do can be used against them. And if they're at home, they really should never open the door at all. Uh, if there is an arrest warrant, they should slip the arrest warrant under the door without opening the door. And if the arrest warrant is valid, then uh, the person really should open the door at that point because they, they would have the right to break down the door at that time if they have a valid arrest warrant and somebody will not open the door. But so many times people are caught in what's called collateral damage where they start talking to somebody and then they find out that the person's roommate is from Mexico and then, you know, they start arresting people. Even the people who they didn't come to find and another thing, I, I just want to say briefly, that since 2001, 23 databases have been combined into one database. Uh, and this, this is regarding the criminal histories of people that go back 20 years. And so I have a very respectable client who's from Salinas and has his own electrical company making $300,000 a year. And ICE showed up at his house one morning and arrested him for a conviction from 1994. So that's how far back the databases are taking people, and ICE is being aggressive and arresting people who have passed, even though they've, they've, they've already um, passed their time in, in jail, um, they're, they're still being arrested 20 years later. There are five basic ways to um, get some relief from deportation. One is uh, voluntary departure. All this does is allows you to go back to your home country and erase from your record, your illegal entry to the United States, which means that you could come in again legally if you have a way to come in legally, which most people don't. Um, and typically, you need to have good moral character for five years and enough money to go back to your home country. Second is adjustment of status. That's only for people, once again, who have married, for example, somebody who entered the country legally. So if you're in deportation proceedings and you entered the country, let's say, as a student, and even if it's, it's even possible to marry somebody in deportation proceedings. If it's a U.S. citizen, then you could adjust status in deportation proceedings. Third, cancellation of removal. I have many cases like this where a person has been here for 10 years, they have good moral character, and they have a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident, spouse, child, or parent who would suffer extraordinary and extremely unusual hardship. That's a level of hardship that's much higher than it used to be in the United States, when before you could actually show hardship to the person being deported, you can't do that anymore. It has to be to a qualifying relative, and they only grant 4,000 cases a year of this cancellation of removal for people who are undocumented. 
And then you can also uh, ask for asylum and withholding of deportation like Rodrigo has in, in, uh, in deportation proceedings and even citizenship. Sometimes people find out that actually their, their mother was a, a US citizen and so they can be a derivative citizen, for example, or get a derivative green card that way. What can be done? Uh, obviously, we, we need comprehensive immigration reform. I'm going to be talking about all of this comprehensive immigration reform, what should be included in it, and all of the different categories as to why people are being deported, especially we're going to go into secure communities at the workshop that I'm giving this afternoon on hot topics. Uh, if you'd like an analysis of uh, comprehensive immigration reform, you can send me an email, and I'll be glad to email you back uh, an analysis that I did back in December 2009 of what should be in comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, we also should be, as was just mentioned in our, with our prior speaker, we, we should be getting some discretionary relief from Obama, and we're not getting it. Um, Luis Gutierrez, congressman from Illinois, did a tour of the entire United States earlier this year, and he was calling for the uh, executive orders that would allow DREAM Act students not to be deported, and that would allow the, uh, the parents of U.S. citizens not to be deported, to keep basically that family unity together. Uh, Obama has not taken up either one of those proposals, and he, uh, he, he talked about the Morton Memo that came out in Ju June 17th, and the Morton Memo gave 19 different factors of discretion that ICE can use before they deport someone. Within the American Immigration Lawyers Association, uh, we've done a, a, a national survey to see if uh, Obama's uh, discretion, prosecutorial discretion, has meant anything? And the answer is no. That ICE is not willing to really engage in terms of using its discretion to give people relief. So he said that 300,000 cases would be reviewed. Uh, we really don't expect you know, much to happen from, from that review. Uh, we, we need to support immigrant integration initiatives, and there's a lot going on at the local level in particular. I know that, uh, well, this afternoon we're going to talk about some of the uh, initiatives throughout the Bay Area around secure communities. For example, on October 18th, Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors decided that it will not detain anyone convicted of anything if they're an immigrant until the federal government reimburses Santa Clara County for detaining that person another day. So um, it's really one of the more progressive. Cook County in Illinois has done something similar. Washington, D.C. has done something similar. So that's, that's uh, something that you can do in your own county. Uh, we had um, uh, the San Jose Police Department, for example, um, ask for ICE to come into the San Jose Police Department for gang abatement. And so our church and many other churches, you know, fought that off because uh, obviously w what undocumented immigrant is going to be reporting a crime to the San Jose Police Department thinking that ICE is, is inside the police department. So uh, fortunately, they withdrew those uh, officers very quickly through a lot of uh, organizing in the community. Another example is the district attorney in Santa Clara County and certainly in Sacramento County, which is really the leader, has decided to um, infract misdemeanors. So there are, there are many misdemeanors that can be committed. Some of them could be made infractions. If they're infractions, then they don't get put into the criminal justice system. They don't go to jail and they can't be picked up by ICE. They can't get an immigration hold if they only commit an infraction. And so driving without a license, driving without a suspended license are examples in Santa Clara County. And uh, the DA is talking about also uh, making petty theft an infraction, uh, which doesn't mean you wouldn't have to pay a lot of community service hours, uh, but it would still be an infraction and that immigrant would not therefore get into the system to possibly be detained. Those are some of the local actions that are taking place. And uh, really, that's where the action is at because of federally, we're really blocked in terms of any significant immigration reform. So that's um, my, uh, at the state level, there are many initiatives. Uh, the governor has just signed three, which are very positive for the state of California. One is AB 131, which allows finally for DREAM Act students to 
have access to a small, small amount of uh, financial aid in California. Uh, secondly is AB 353 that ends the practices throughout the state. Immigrants for 30 days and in essence taking that car away because the impoundment fees are so high, they're higher than the cost of getting the car back. And so it's a way to just grab the property of undocumented immigrants. And fortunately, there were many jurisdictions around the state that actually passed progressive policies. And the state now that says that no jurisdiction in California can do that anymore. They must allow a person um, to, they must allow the immigrant the right to call a person who has a driver's license to drive that car away. And they can't impound the car for 30 days. Another example that was brought, brought forth by Assemblyman Paul Fong would basically uh, not allow uh, jurisdictions in California to require a, a grantee of money, for example, to uh, use the E-Verify system. So they can't require uh, grants, grantees, for example, to use the electronic E-Verify system that uh, pretty much captures all undocumented immigrants who apply for a job, they can't do that anymore. So that's, those are three big victories in California and we really need to celebrate those because we, our celebrations are <laughs> few. Can we celebrate those? So our bottom line here is that we need to organize and mobilize the, ourselves and immigrants to support humane laws. Uh, we need to be involved in the political process. We should not be supporting our congresspeople who uh, don't support comprehensive immigration reform. And we need to stand on the side of love. So I'll be glad to take any questions at this point. Yes. Most of the un undocumented people that have been detained, in, under what circumstances have they been detained? Are they agricultural workers through raids or individual cases? Yeah, they're, they're mostly individual cases at this point. Uh, I, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, this week, uh, a man was w who works for a recycling company in Oakland, and he's from Nicaragua and undocumented, was driving with his boss from Phoenix to back to Oakland. And right when they got to the California border, right before the border, there was a, a checkpoint. And it was the Border Patrol. And the Border Patrol detained him, took his luggage, took him first to, what is it called, Bryce? Or what's the name of that little town? What is it? Blythe. And then to um, uh, Arizona. And now he's in the Eloy Detention Center. And he has a very messy case. I'm representing him uh, because, as I mentioned, under cancellation of removal, he has been here for 20 years. And he does have good moral character. He's never been arrested. But uh, he didn't marry his fiance. And his fiance had uh, one abortion. And so he doesn't have a US citizen child either. And without a qualifying relative, he's ineligible for cancellation of removal. So that's an example where there's a checkpoint in Arizona. I have many cases of people who are in the Milpitas County Jail, which is the jail for Santa Clara County. And I've gone in there many times. And I'll give you one example um, that happened two weeks ago. A, uh, a man who had been in the country, had pay stubs for every year to show he'd been here for at least 12 years. He had U.S. citizen children, so he had everything for cancellation of removal. And so when he met with the ICE person, remember, never talk to ICE. ICE said, you have no remedies. Sign here. And so he agreed to sign for voluntary departure. He left the country. He came back in, and that's when I met him he, because uh, he had a warrant out for his arrest when he, he, he came back in. And, uh, and at that point, he uh, <coughs> was uh, asked, he asked again to, for cancellation of removal. And he called me from the San Jose USCIS because ICE had taken him there to Monterey Road. And 
He said, ICE is saying that I didn't get voluntary departure two years ago. It's saying that I was deported. And therefore, ICE is saying that I don't have the right to talk to an attorney and that they're just going to deport me. And that's what they did. Because even though they told him he had signed for voluntary departure, they had not voluntary departure. They had deported him two years ago. And so he basically lost all of his opportunities at that time. I can tell you story after story. I mean, I have the great benefit of being an immigration attorney, of hearing stories all day long. Uh, time for more? Or? Uh, 287G, you, you mentioned. Uh, are, are there Northern California communities that participate in, in that program? Fortunately not. Good. Mm -hmm. I know that we um, got started late. It is 12.15. The rest of the folks are standing outside the door um, wanting to come in and eat lunch. And I know that Richard will be available um, to talk with folks um, before.